Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the, uh, the morning session. You're in the session cars, getting your license, new car models, and commercialization. Um, this was organized the bi by the Bio Industry Liaison Committee, uh, and my co-chair, Mark Bonaddi, uh, serves on that committee. Unfortunately, he's not going to be here today. Um, but I'll try my best to fill his shoes. Um, so this session is comprised of uh, three 25 to 30 minute talks, followed by a panel discussion. Um, sadly, I also have heard that uh, Carl is double booked, so uh, he's going to unfortunately have to leave uh, shortly after his talk uh, and won't be able to stay for the panel. Um, just a couple of announcements. Uh, please just remember to silence your cell phones or any noisy mobile devices. Um, Photography is allowed, but please, if you do take pictures, uh, please don't use your flash and be mindful of, of people around you. Um, and uh, we do ask that you try to fill out evaluations. Uh, the, this is now done through the ASGCT app. Uh, they're no longer paper forms. So, so just to frame the session this morning, um, you know, since our last ASGCT conference, the field has seen the remarkable approval of the first two gene therapies in the U.S., which is a, a huge historical uh, moment, and also the world's first two engineered T-cell therapies for patients with cancer. Uh, first, the, with the approval of Chimera in August uh, and for pediatric ALL, and actually just earlier this month, they also got approval for much broader indication uh, with diffuse large cell um, uh, B-cell lymphoma. And also the approval of YesCarta, which uh, followed shortly after in, in October uh, 2017. And so I just uh, wanted to comment that the timing from the initial definitive proof of concept of the CD19 CAR data, which came out in 2011, to the actual commercial approvals was astonishingly fast. And that, I think, is even more remarkable by the fact that the manufacturing challenges, this, um, some of the unique, unique safety considerations, um, uh, and also some of the operational challenges were all uh, completely unmapped uh, uh, unchartered territory. It was an, uh, there was no map for it. So today, um, we're going to hear from three speakers who have intimate knowledge of this landscape, starting, uh, starting with Carl June. Uh, Carl is the Richard Vague Professor in Immunotherapy. He's the director of the Center for Cellular Immunotherapy, a director of the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunology um, at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, and, and recent, uh, recently founded T-Immunity. Uh, he's one of the early believers in the power of immunotherapy, and he's dedicated his life to driving the rapid development of T-cell therapy to help patients. Uh, he's one of the hardest working and most dedicated people I know, uh, and he uh, has developed enabling technology for T-cell expansion, uh, and has been a champion for uh, clinical development of novel T-cell engineering technology, and accordingly has a long track record of firsts in human T-cell therapies, such as the first lentiviral vector in humans, uh, the first gene editing study, the first CRISPR study, these are all studies that, that he helped to push forward. So, you know, without him, I'm certain that the rapid development of Chimera would not have, have occurred so quickly. He's really helped to, to make the map for us. So he's going to tell us more about this today and the future of the space uh, in his talk entitled The History of Car Approval and Next Generation Cars. Thank, thank you very much, Gwen, and um, it's really a pleasure to be here um, in this year now of car, uh, commercial CAR T cells. So, um, and I have um, uh, you know conflicts both with and sponsored research from uh, Novartis and uh, Timunity. So, um, just to to put this in perspective, the um, space of, of T cells in the immune system is is probably best shown in this most frequent slide you see in an immuno-oncology meeting that, that uh, Ira Melman and his colleagues made. And, and it, we have very complicated tumor microenvironments, um, and they vary by different tumors. Um, and where CAR T cells fit is, is really this uh, step six, where we can increase and augment the number of cells that can actually kill tumors. And so far, all our data says that when CAR T cells work, it's because they achieve an, uh, an effective effector to target ratio in the patient. So they need to proliferate and then they 
um, can have uh, anti-tumor effects in a variety of tumors. Um, and, you know, so CAR T-cells have been designed now over almost 30 years, initially uh, made by uh, Art Weiss and his colleagues at UCSF as a, as a basic science experiment to understand how the T-cell receptor worked. And they made a, what's called now a first-generation CAR that had the zeta chain of the T-cell receptor and linked to CD4. And actually, the first CAR T-cell trial were, were, were done in HIV. And um, we, we conducted three trials over a, a span of years, both in Bethesda at the University of Pennsylvania, to test uh, these CAR T cells in HIV and whether or not they would have an antiviral effect or be safe. So these bound to the envelope protein of HIV and then um, retargeted T cells so that they could actually kill cells that express HIV. And, um, um, and uh, so the studies are all published, but they taught us a lot. Um, a total of 39 patients were infused where we had data, and, and because of the FDA's forward-looking um, uh, policy on long-term follow-up, we found that they persisted for up to at least 11 years in these patients. And these patients did not get conditioning chemotherapy. They had a single infusion. And um, we had uh, you know, more than a half-life of 17 years in the three studies so that these engineered T cells can persist for decades. We know that now in HIV, and we're now seeing that and the same thing in, in cancer patients. And most importantly, in studies we did with Rick Bushman, there were no toxicity. So not a single patient had integration near oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes, um, and no uh, long-term safety issues. And this is data recently summarized by uh, Bruce Levine at the University of Pennsylvania, looking at all the studies we've done over the years with various forms of genetically engineered T cells. So there are more than 1,700 patient years of follow-up here in, in the patients we've treated, and um, not a single patient's had T cell transformation, so no leukemia or lymphoma. So we can now statistically say that that is safer than chemotherapy, because in chemotherapy, about 5% of patients get secondary AML within several years after treatment, you know, if they've benefited and they um, overcome their initial tumor. So gene-modified T cells are safe. We have ongoing registries to show this. Um, and it doesn't mean that will be the same for all kinds of engineered cells. So stem cells have a different safety profile than T cells do. But um, with T cells, at least, we do have this track record in the field. So uh, these have been now uh, summarized in several publications here uh, in, in the field. We've gotten together um, with investigators, pooled our data, and so it's not just a single center, but all the studies from Baylor, the Fred Hutch, University of Pennsylvania, and so on, we have not seen uh, any transformation in, in T cells. So um, we think really the uh, FDA now needs to change policies on how we do um, um, you know, the, the approval and release of each CAR T cell product, which right now, or with TCR engineered cells, we, on each patient, we are looking for replication competent viruses, and we've never found one. So we think now that, I mean, that right now is cost that doesn't need to be spent in the manufacturing, and we could have a cheaper product if we didn't do that. So it's time to revise the test requirements for retroviral or lentiviral transduced T cells based on this safety record with advanced vectors that have been developed in the field. Um, so going back, this was, that was where the field started, was HIV, and then it pivoted to cancer with second generation cars that have either 4NBB as a signaling co-stimulatory domain or CD28, and this is what the Kite product has, and this is what the Novartis product has. The, the reason that happened is when, when it was tested at the NIH um, with, in cancer patients, cars that had a single zeta chain did not persist, as we saw with, uh, in, in HIV. So the immunotoxic microenvironment is much more hostile to T cells in cancer patients than it is in, in um, uh, HIV. So um, there's been a lot of work now on what the signaling domains do in, in CAR T cells, and there's some references here. But basically, we can now make bispecific cells you know, to, sp to target nearly any specificity, but it also reprograms a cell. And, and that now, we realize, depends on what kind of cell the CAR lands in. So the optimal signaling domain 
varies in CD4 cells or CD8 cells. Um, and um, it also can reprogram the metabolic state of T cells. So we have found that you can actually microscopically identify the car by how many mitochondria are in the cell. So that if you have uh, a 4 BB signaling domain, the cell becomes um, biogenically uh, active and, and makes more mitochondria than, and if it has a CD28 signaling domain, it's more, um, uses uh, sugars as its metabolic um, fuel. So we can make long-lived or short-lived cells depending on the signaling domains. Um, so we began our studies in uh, 2010 with this second generation car that has a 4 BB signaling domain. Uh, and the initial patients had um, uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And then, uh, as Gwen mentioned, it got FDA approval just last summer. And this is the first patient who was ever treated with Bruce Levine, Gwen, and Zoe, and, and Les Lido in our center. We had no idea what would happen in mice. What we found is patients with B-cell leukemia, the mice was, were cured. And that's what happened in this patient now seven years later. But he almost died from cytokine release syndrome, which the mice never got. We had no idea what was happening at the time, but he had fevers for weeks and weeks, and um, they were non-infectious, and we didn't have any treatment for cytokine release syndrome at that point. He, he got none. Uh, what he was treated with were antibiotics. It was only retrospectively later that we found out that he had had um, had that. But you know, we have we found in our initial phase one study a, a 70 percent um, uh, response rate in CLL, and, and at this time back. A few years ago, we had treated 62, and it was inconceivable that this could actually become a commercially approved product. No one thought it could happen, including me. Um, and this is what happened. So that's, that was Bill Ludwig in 2010. And then at the time of FDA approval, he came and we had a party at the University of Pennsylvania. And he has this shirt and it says, you know, I was patient number one, and all I got was this T-shirt <laughs> and remission. But, what, what you can see is he, he has no hair here, and that was because he'd had bendamustine and other chemotherapies. He still has no hair. That's because he's now over 70 and, and fine. But what he, um, he's still in a hospital infusion bed, and that the one liability right now of these cars is he's getting uh, intravenous gamma globulin. That's why he's at the hospital there. So he still has B-cell aplasia, and, um, but he has no leukemia. So that's, um, and we just studied this now in, in a paper it actually was published in Nature Medicine earlier this month. Um, the, this is Bill Ludwig and the second patient we treated. Um, and now with follow-up of seven years, they have long-term persistent, which is shown in the red, of the car cells for um, out to seven years. And they have persistent B-cell aplasia. Their, all of their B-cells have germline IGH. And that's why um, the patients are getting gamma globulin. We don't really know if they need gamma globulin infusions, but that's a standard practice. So this is the first living drug, and it's based on autologous T cells that have the car engineered in there. And we were able to study these patients and look at the responding patients and the non-responding and do transcriptomics. And if you do that, the CR patients are very different than the non-responding patients with CLL. And, and if you do TISNI plots, the CR patients come up here and the non-responding patients there. It's a the, the patients who don't respond, it's not due to the tumor, it's due to the T-cell failure. And what this data shows is it's exhaustion in the T-cells. It's present at the time of manufacturing. So the patients who have CRs have the kinds of things and features you see in effective T-cells, and the ones who have non-response have, um, have uh, the features in exhausted cells. This is very different than what we see in ALL, where basically all the patients respond. So, so the tumor response depends on what kind of tumor you have. And we were able to actually look at that further by taking the T cells we treated these patients and use a leukemia line that John Bird developed at Ohio State for CLL. And, and if you treat patients with uh, the mice, actually, with CLL, they die in about 20 days. And if you give them uh, a CAR T cell preparation made from a patient who had a complete response, it cures the mice. And if, they, if you give them a T cell product that failed in the patient, they also fail in the mice. So it's a T cell intrinsic issue. Um, so that's summarized in this work here, showing that um, the T cell product is important. You can actually predict at the time of apheresis who will respond and who will not. The patients who have long-term responses have CD27 positive, CAR T cells that are PD1 negative, and interestingly have a STAT3 L6 receptor 
signaling pathway in, in the T cells it's active. Um, so that's how we started, was treating CLL, um, and, and, um, and we've seen very long-term responses. We then treated our first ALL patient in 2013, and uh, this is a patient who had a hypodiploid leukemia that is, the, which we know basically never responds to chemotherapy. And, um, uh, and he had persistent disease despite um, the, as intensive therapy as they could give him at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in Seattle. And we treated him then in 2013. And this is what happened. He had severe cytokine release syndrome, exactly that we see in uh, same as CLL, the kinetics, peaks at about 10 days. He, um, had, and this is ferritin and uh, C-reactive protein, which are biomarkers of, of this uh, CRS. And he then was treated with tocilizumab, an anti-IL-6 receptor antagonist, and had this rapidly response to, to that with defervescence. His temperature reached 107 degrees for two days. The, the, the nurses actually thought his, uh, that the thermometers were broken when, when his temperature was 107. But now, at that time, we knew about what CRS was. He was treated with tocilizumab, and then he had benefits. So this is what he looked like at baseline with a packed bone marrow with monomorphic ALL blast, and then a month later, complete remission. Um, and uh, uh, this is what he looked like. So this patient now is um, a professor at the University of uh, Pennsylvania, and it's Keith Eaton. And, um, he now has recently published a paper, which I'm referring to in, in Kaiser Health News, about the issue of financial toxicity, which is that the CAR T cells cost a lot. And even though he was on our protocol and the CAR T cells were paid by the protocol, it cost his insurance company $500,000 with all the ancillary therapies he got, including ICU care and so on. So this is an issue that society needs to address. How do you have a curative therapy? and not have financial toxicity. We don't have that at this point. So we then also treated children, um, and our first pediatric patient was um, Emily Whitehead, shown here. Um, when um, we presented her results, uh, she was treated in April of 2012, and then front page of the New York Times uh, in December. And we learned a lot from her, but one is that you get a lot more publicity came out of treating cute children than it does with men that have no hair. And, um, um, and uh, so she just had her six years now of, of remission, but she had, similar to Keith Eaton, a, a form of ALL that's never cured with chemotherapy, a high-risk tumor that was, uh, had an uh, Icaros uh, knockout, and she got standard children's oncology group chemotherapy and so on, and never went in any sustained remission and got CAR T cells at a dose that we treat our adults with, and then she developed um, even more severe cytokine release syndrome. Um, but what we learned in her was really astonishing because we had bone marrows at the time of her CRS and then uh, three weeks later. And this is day six. And at that time, um, she was hospitalized with multi-organ failure with a CRS. And this is what her bone marrow looked like. There were blasts. These are C19 and C20 positive cells and no CAR T, -T cells. Then this 14 days later, she had no blasts but uh, an amazing amount of CAR T cells in the bone marrow. The bone marrow actually looked like a lymph node at this point. And if you look in literature, the bone marrow is made of both red hematopoietic marrow and then the yellow marrow. It's over 1.5 liters in, in a child that age. 1.5 liters then translates to over a kilogram of CAR T cells, because a kilo is about 10 to the 12 cells. So she biosynthetically made in her own body 10 to the 12th CAR T cells in 14 days. She was a bioreactor, and that's what correlates with responses, is many, many cells that get an effector to target ratio. So um, we found, you know, she was the first patient. She's now six years out, a very high response rate in ALL. Um, and, uh, you know, and that actually quite amazingly was reproduced at the multicenter study that Novartis did at both U.S. and ex-U.S. sites you know, culminating in FDA approval. It's unbelievable that they were able to get the same response rate at a multicenter trial, and there were no deaths from cytokine release syndrome. There was a 48% incidence of CRS in those patients in, on this trial, but no deaths. And uh, so that culminated in FDA approval, lots of uh, publicity, in, you know, uh, in August of last summer. And um, then just more recently, both Kite and then Novartis got uh, from Steve Schuster's data at the University of Pennsylvania approval in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, where we see basically the same side effects 
but beneficial effects. So now at this point, in, in blood cancers, we have for page, patients age 3 to 25 after approval in ALL, and in diffuse large B cell lymphoma, uh, yes, CARD and Camraya, uh, for patients who've had uh, twice relapsed or progressive uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And, you know, the amazing thing about this is, is some luck was involved in this. This is uh, my daughter who has juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, diagnosed in 2001, and then um, I was president of the, of the Clinical Immunology Society in 2010 and gave the award to Tada Kishimoto, a professor from Japan, who had developed tocilizumab to treat JRA. That's its first FDA approval. And um, so that's how I knew about it. And then when we had very high levels in our patients of IL-6 during CRS, we thought that might be actionable. And that's how Emily Whitehead and Keith Eaton were treated. So um, FDA approval happened. It's called tisogen like glucil. It's intentionally made so you cannot pronounce it. Um, but it has two black box warnings, and one of them is for cytokine release syndrome, and that's co-labeled now with tocilizumab, and also neurologic toxicities, which include um, usually reversible forms of, and, and still the mechanisms unknown, but occurs both with CD19-directed therapies from um, blinitumumab, the bispecific antibody, as well as CAR T cells. Um, and Something that a lot of uh, people don't know is that it also can give you a false positive assay for HIV because of the lenoviral backbone that's used to introduce uh, the CAR T cell. Um, so uh, tocilizumab is co-labeled both with um, uh, the, the Kai product and the Novartis product. Um, and, um, you know, initially indication in, in uh, arthritis and, and now for cytokine uh, release syndrome. Um, we found in our patients one, uh, another unexpected issue, which is um, if you look in the blood, they, they have pe these are the first two patients we treated with ALL. They peak at about 10 days, the CAR T cells do, and, and this goes up to this 100% of the cells basically are CAR T cells at that time. And so if you do a right stay, and that's what they look like in the blood, They're, they look like um, activated lymphoblasts, as you, you would see, for instance, in, in mononucleosis. Um, with an infection with EBV, um, and uh, in, but they also traffic to the cerebral spinal fluid. So if you do a tap, this is what they look like if you uh, spin them down in a cytospin. So they traffic into the brain even in patients who do not have uh, any uh, brain or CNS tumor. Uh, we found several mechanisms now of resistance to CAR T cells. Uh, one is in ALL where the incidence is 28% of target loss, where the C19 molecule uh, is lost from the surface of the cells via several genetic uh, mechanisms. In CLL, I mentioned we see T cell exhaustion, and we've seen rarely now something we call CAR-B. And this is work from Marco Ruella in our group, where um, we had a patient who had a CR, CARs went up, came down, and then they went back up again in the peripheral circulation starting nine months after we treated him, this patient. and. Um, um, at, this is staining by flow cytometry with an anti-idiotype, looking at uh, CAR on the surface. And it's, this is CD3 staining, so you would expect the CARs to be here. They're not. They were in a CD45 dim population of leukemic blast cells. So this patient relapsed with CARs in his leukemia. It was a subclone of his parental tumor. And we found that CAR was integrated into two genes, including neuropillin 1 in the patient's CAR uh, leukemia cells, and that then masked, this is showing CD19 at baseline, and at the time of relapse nine months later, he still has CD19, but it's masked by the car that infected his blast cells, and that created its own escape. So we've, this patient had 80% blast at the time we released him, and one of those cells got infected with a virus, and then that led to a CD19 negative escape through this masking mechanism. And uh, what was infused in this product was an incredibly pure product. It was 99.7% T cells, but there was a rare cell in there. It was a subclone of his original tumor, had the same IgH mutation, and that then unfortunately re resulted in his relapse. And we found this at low levels in seven out of 18 patients that we've looked at. So this points to an increasing need to get uh, pure products um, and, um, in, in that we infused in the patients. So what about bites? So bites are bispecific antibodies, two linked, um, and they bind in a similar way uh, to what a CAR T cell does. They can target CD19, 
and then anti-CD3 and bridge from the tumor cell to a T cell, and then the T cell will lyse the, the target, which is the blast. And they have the similar neuro neurotoxicity and cytokine release syndrome. Um, and both strategies are very importantly MHC independent, so you don't have to do HLA matching. They're given without chemotherapy conditioning, unlike CAR T cells. And they, um, the CARs, though, have a very different distribution. They actively transfer and traffic to tumor, whereas bites work by water diffusion, passive diffusion. So there's differences in how they uh, traffic. Um, and, but CARs are very much more complex to make. They're individually made. And bites are off the shelf um, and a, a recombinant protein, much simpler to make. Um, and uh, we've recently combined CAR T cells with bites. And this is work that Sonia Gaydon did in our lab and now. Uh, she has her own lab. But this is where Dan um, Powell, a fuller receptor alpha CAR, that, that is soon going to be used in ovarian cancer, and combine that CAR T cell with an, an oncolytic virus that expresses a bite. In this case, it's either one against cetuximab, EGFR, or, or, or uh, VEGF. And um, when we do that, this is what happens if we treat just with a CAR alone. We get some anti-tumor effects, and much better if we uh, treat in the xenograft mice with a CAR that also has um, the secretes a bite, the oncolytic adenovirus. So there's much better survival in these mice. So, so we think combining oncolytic viruses, and there's various types, will en enhance CARs, probably also result in priming to uh, neoantigens and, and sustain the activity of, of CAR T cells, um, which is what we found here, to another target by linking the bite in with a CAR. So many strategies will happen. Um, we have tri trials now at Penn, and they're elsewhere now targeting myeloma, the most common hemologic malignancy. And this is a trial led by Al Garfal at the University of Pennsylvania, and initially started with Marcella Mouse at Penn, and using the target BCMA, B cell maturation antigen, uh, CD279, um, for myeloma. And um, so BCMA is an attractive target, completely independent from CD19, um, and it has two ligands, uh, um, BAF and April, on myeloma cells, and it's not on the immature uh, myeloma cells. And if you have a mouse that has no BCMA, they don't have long-lived plasma cells. So it's a lineage antigen similar to C19, but on the late stage. And um, we have an ongoing trial at the University of Pennsylvania with Novartis. And um, in the initial cohort, we, we gave a low dose of these CAR T cells against BCMA and no conditioning chemotherapy. Um, and what we have is a variety of responses. Uh, but identical proliferation of the CAR looks just like what we see in CD19 and CLL. So in some patients, there's massive proliferation and long-term persistence. And in other patients, there's very poor proliferation. There's a log scale of the number of CARs in the blood. Um, and the, those patients have progressive disease. The patients with uh, high proliferation of the CARs have uh, that. And our first patient was uh, actually on that trial, as shown here. He's a professor at the University of Texas. I didn't know who he was until he emailed me in December. And then he actually had closed his lab, retired, and then now that he's in remission for several years, he reopened his lab, and they had a press release at the University of Texas describing this. So it's uh, Woody uh, Wright. Uh, so we're at this point to sum up in uh, the field of CAR therapies, where it's now become one of the tools we have for oncology, uh, along with you know the standards we've had over the years of surgery, radiation, chemotherapy. And we can now look to, for instance, combining CAR T cells with checkpoint antibodies with oncolytic viruses and targeted agents. We have a trial at the University of Pennsylvania now testing a BTK inhibitor, ibrutinib, with CAR T cells. And so we'll have many different combinations over the years, I think. And uh, that'll be a, a main focus of the field. Uh, my lab has been very in, you know, instrumental in this work um, shown here. And, um, I'd like to thank all my colleagues, both at the University of Pennsylvania um, and uh, Children's Hospital, Novartis, and, and our patients who have uh, volunteered in these studies. So thank you very much for your attention.